Hey everyone, welcome back to Bold Faith Bible. I have a special guest with me uh, today, uh, Michael from uh, On Point Preparedness. Uh, Hello. Now, now that's a preparedness channel, but uh, yeah. Yeah. It, you actually handle more uh, biblical and doctrinal kind of issues and, and kind of movements within churches and such. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's a really neat thing about that. Um, would you uh, mind just sharing a little bit what your channel is about? Yes. Yeah, so actually, so On Point Preparedness was my channel, which really started in preparedness based on all the worldly events that were happening. Even 10 years back, there was a lot of turbulence. And obviously with popular preparedness, you're talking about sort of the same things. And back then, because I saw what was on the horizon and, and a lot of the worst stuff that we're seeing is coming out right now, mm -hmm. I started saying to myself, is this it? it, it is this it? Is it just preparing physically? Mm -hmm. and, and that's where it ends. And I said, there had to be something spiritual there has to be something to look forward to spiritually and so i had grown up um, with some christian roots through my family but i wasn't necessarily a believer and it was only until you know i really submitted to god and i said god you know what is what is this all for what you know what am i here for on uh, in this world and in my life and you know, the lord or i came to know the lord or he came to know me and it was a very powerful conversion to where i said i need to live my life for the lord and so while I had this On Point Preparedness channel that was all talking about getting people prepared, I actually switched that over to be more ministry oriented. So I still talk about you know, signs of what's going on in the world and, and the need to prepare, but also to get people spiritually prepared because ultimately that's, that's really what we need to be doing. And uh, Christians need to be you know, continually yeah. getting refined in the word and um, you know, getting prepared. Um, so yeah, that's what I've been doing mostly on my channel, just sort of hitting both of those topics. Yeah, it's great stuff. Um, you can check them out in the description down below. There'll be a link over to On Point Preparedness if you want to check that out after the end of this video. But um, for this video, I'd like to just ha kind of pick your brain over some uh, just some passages and some uh, some verses maybe you've been kind of thinking about. I asked you to kind of like uh, some verses that you're either studying now or that have had a big impact on your life. Yep. And I know that you've gotten some uh, pulled out for us to have a little conversation. Yep. Got a, got a quick little study here. This is actually... Um, this meant a lot to me because this was really a pivotal moment in terms of me beginning ministry and sort of being called to use my gifts to teach on certain scriptural aspects. Um, I was reading through the Old Testament, and I think a lot of Christians, they have difficulty with the Old Testament. We were talking a little bit about it. It's 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 big. <laughs> it's, it's a yeah. lot bigger than the New Testament. So I think lost in there. Right? Yeah, people are a little <laughs> little skittish. And then you know, there's all, there's all these different places and people's names. And then even some of the content, like a lot of people are confused because there's a lot of bloodshed in in the Old Testament. And there's a lot of things that seem to be, and they're not at odds with Jesus in the New Testament and his his message of grace and love. But you know, mm -hmm. people start to to see these differences, and yeah. unfortunately, it, it can start to develop into incorrect thoughts regarding scripture. Uh, really, the Old Testament and the New Testament are woven together. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one cohesive word of God, the scripture of God, um, that's you know, inerrant, infallible, and it's, it's fully in truth. Yeah. And you know, all the prophecies from the Old Testament, or you know, many of them, are all fulfilled in the New Testament. What do you mean Testament. by prophecies? Let's, let's back up. I don't want to leave anyone behind. Right. When you say prophecies in the Old Testament. Like concerning the Christ. Okay. Um, so like, you know, there's, I don't know how many there are, but there was all these multiple prophecies. Like if you think about Isaiah and it talks about, you know, I have all my bones and evil doers like dogs, they, mm -hmm. they want to pierce my hands and my feet. I, I'm paraphrasing essentially. Yeah. But you look at that, that prophetic statement in the prophet Isaiah and you see what happened to Jesus. You're like, wow, wow, that, that, that was definitely a prophecy fulfilled. Many hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus, right? Right. How could he have known? Yep. And it's, just, it's so beautiful. And even though it's a hard read, it's so beautiful to start to see a lot of things from the Old Testament being fulfilled you know, in Christ or in the New Testament. And particularly, one of the things that I wanted to cover on your channel, which we were talking a little bit here earlier, is just how Paul, who's the writer of much of the New Testament, he actually mm -hmm. refers back to the Old Testament quite a few times, yeah. uh, and he actually refers back to the law. And so I thought maybe we could go over some verses which really, at the very beginning of my ministry, 
compelled me in a certain way in order to read more into the, New, the Old Testament and, and teach on it. So. Sure. Yeah, let's hop in. All right. So again, this is, this is sort of like an odd set of verses, you know, because Steve asked me, let's just cover some of your favorite verses. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's sort of difficult, but you know, I can maybe yeah. cover a favorite topic because this topic, again, is what really pushed me into ministry. It was really a calling from God. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so these set of verses, it might sound a little weird that these are my favorite, but uh, you'll get the point here. So we're actually going to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Mm -hmm. And so this is actually talking about some of the old law, some of the, some of the commands in the old law of Moses. And it says, these are you know, guidances for Israel. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest the whole yield be forfeited, the crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. And so you, know, you read through a lot of these Old Testament laws, and I think people are sort of like, why, why is God concerned with people wearing wool and linen together? Like, is that, some people say, is that sin? Or <laughs> like, is that bad? Sure. You know, should I look into these? And, you know, particularly, there's, there's some segments of Christianity that go into that, and they think it's sin, but that's for a topic for another day. But, you know, it's sort of odd. And so what I wanted to do was just bring a little bit of light in terms of maybe what God, or, or what God is teaching us through the old law. And we look at the Apostle Paul's teachings. So how do we, how do we, we see a verse like that, right? Mm -hmm. And we, and we may initially kind of say, I don't get that. Right. How do we as Christians with the whole Bible in front of us, how mm -hmm. do we start to process what that really means? Right. So I mean, do I just like come up with an idea? And some, some do, right? Like some <laughs> will just think, oh, you know, this is, you actually start to get into very esoteric, Gnostic, just people start to come up with signs and symbols and gematria. They pray about it and then they get a feeling or they get a vision, vision or, and, they, yeah. or it applies to some random event that, that they're seeking, you know, insight into, right. you know, like, you know, God, why is, why is all the cropland, you know, uh, mm. shriveling up? And then, then they're just plopping their Bible open. They come to right. this verse yeah. and it's like, oh, huh, well, yeah. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, it's so, like no, that's not what it's talking about at all. Yeah, this this type of study, you have to have an. A, it has to be based on a currently known biblical truth. Like right. when you're comparing, it. and I'm going to give you like one example, but you know, with this with this type of study, this is definitely not milk, which is like studies for a new Christian. Uh, there, there's this principle of. Milk but you're welcome the, to stay and listen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome if to you stay. Are a new Christian. So this this was really what you know the Bible would say is more meat. This is um, just, a, you know, a little bit more in depth into you know, getting into God's so word. You just kind of hinted on that, but finding, if you think you found something in scripture, you should be able to find that elsewhere in scripture. Right. It's, you should have an abundance of yeah. evidence in scripture. Because scripture always agrees with each other. Right. If you can only find something one place in scripture, it better be awfully darn clear yep. because otherwise you might be just misinterpreting. It. Yep. So right. scripture has to interpret scripture and it has to be, even if you think scripture is interpreting scripture, which yeah. a lot of people do and they're still wrong, you know, there, yeah. there needs to be testing. You know, it's just like you need to have brothers sure. uh, and the Lord um, to, to test this out. So re regarding these, these couple of verses, again, it, it sounds sort of odd. Why is God concerned with people wearing wool and linen together? Why? You know, what's so bad about a vineyard and two types of seed? Like, is it, is that, what is the God who created everything? Why is he so concerned with that? Well, I want to just bring your attention to, again, this is where we start to you know, build evidence for maybe what that means. Uh, we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, and these are some of the verses where Paul starts to interpret the Old Testament for us, like some of these, some of these old laws. Yeah. And he says, starting in verse 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? So he's like, this isn't just coming from me. This is coming from God's law. And so he points back to the Old Testament and he continues, For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for the oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? Mm -hmm. It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. And so what this verse is really in context about, it's about you 
plowing God's field, you seeding the gospel, you bring, bringing people to Christ, that those who do such things can make a modest earning. And so it's just interesting and that... Getting paid for your work, right? Getting it's paid honest for work your, for honest uh, wage. Yeah, and the gospel's free, right? Yeah. That's, that's the thing we have to make mention of. The gospel is free, but you know, there's people that are dedicating their lives and they're sowing into other people through God's word, and you, you can make an earnest mm -hmm. um, type of wage from that. And that's, that's what Paul is speaking here. You know, we have the liberty for that. But um, it's just so interesting because, you know, Paul goes back to the old law and he's like, you shall not muzzle, you shall not cover up an oxen, you should not like withhold from it when it's treading out the grain for you, it's, it's working for you. And so he's like, was God really concerned for the oxen when he wrote that law? Like, certainly it's a, it's a practical law, right? You don't want to muzzle your oxen when it's doing this work for you, but... It's just cruel. Yeah, that's it's a cruel <laughs> thing to do. And you wonder if they read that, like, well, yeah, like, I'm, I'm going to feed my oxen. Like, why? Well, I, I can see why you wouldn't want to, because you don't or, want yeah. them to eat in the good grain. You want them just to go eat grass. True, yep. Um, but, but that's the thing, as he's doing the work to, to provide the grain for you, um, you you can't be cruel and unfair mm -hmm. so as to not um, give due wages to, uh, in this case, an ox. Yeah. But as Paul says, that should be applied to uh, treating people fairly. Mm -hmm. If someone works for you, you should, you should pay them yep. or at least offer to pay them. And so this is, I mean, it's really interesting because, you know, here we have scripture, canonized scripture, where Paul is referring back to the old law and saying the true spiritual meaning behind this is... <laughs> It's actually applying to us. Sure. And so, you know, when I look back at those verses that we covered in Deuteronomy, sowing a vineyard with two types of seed, don't plow with an ox and donkey together, don't wear wool and linen together. Um, when I was reading through that, really God convicted me that, you know what, there's, there's elsewhere in Scripture that sounds a lot, like, very, very similar. You know, God's using seeds and vineyard like that type of terminology is used throughout scripture and so actually if you look at genesis chapter 3 verse 15 it says and i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel or elsewhere um there's verses which talk about planting a vineyard and um you know, you're seeding a vineyard and if there's like thorns or thistles that get into it, you know, the, the vineyard is sort of destroyed. So here it's uh, Luke chapter 13 verses 6 through 9. And he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why should I use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of examples in the Bible where God's talking about the field and the vineyard <laughs> sort of being like this, this, this world, like where, where we're sowing into. Yeah. Um, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9, it says, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's yeah. building. So like here we have a direct... Um, you know, scripture in the New Testament saying, you are God's field. Um, and so, you know, you start to look at that and you say two types of seed in a field. And you already see that there's, you know, in the beginning yeah. of Genesis, there's two types of seed that will have enmity. And you look at... Can't um, help but think of uh, Jesus with the wheat and the tares, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. they, they, look, there, they look identical until the harvest. You know, they, yeah. they look the same. Um, and so... Already in, in the first verse, two types of seed in the vineyard, it means that there's two things that are very different which shouldn't be growing together. And then if you look at the next verse in Deuteronomy, which was about hooking together an ox and a donkey, you know, two very different types of animals. If you can yeah. think about yoking them up, you know, harnessing them up, that's going to be a disaster. Um, the oxen is going to be dragging that donkey all around. They're just going to, it's just not going to work. Yeah. And then you start to, you know, you start to think about New Testament verses like here, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness? So it's talking about 
don't be unequally yoked in your marriage, you know, believers and unbelievers, um, but also just, you know, really the believer getting integrated into the world, um, getting invested in the things that they really shouldn't be invested in. Like we can't come out of the world, right? <laughs> but right. but there, there's certain things where we shouldn't be like yoked with it. So you start to see a theme here. It can be even like uh, very close business relationships. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. It, any kind of place where where your purposes need to be aligned. You right. Should, uh, you should be aligned with people that have same similar purposes. Yeah. There's a there's a psalm or a proverb proverb that says, um, "Don't be deceived." Or maybe this is in the New Testament. It says, um, "Bad morals ruin good company." Or um, bad company that's ruins good morals. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So, so yeah, we see two types of seed in a vineyard. We see an un unequally yoking between oxen and a donkey. And then, you know, if you think about wool and linen, those are very different. Right? Yeah. Uh, linen, obviously, in the Old Testament, there's a lot of verses about how yeah. you dress in your fine linens, mm -hmm. and it's very soft. And then, obviously, wool is, serves a different purpose, and it's. <laughs> Talking about the prepper side of things, if you've ever worn a wool coat, it's not, you know, it has its purpose, but it's, it's yeah. definitely not linen. And so, you know, similar to how Paul talks about, you know, the, the oxen and treading the grain, I started to see similarities, you know, verified in a lot of New Testament teachings of, you know what? I wonder if this, these three verses in Deuteronomy are really just talking about the spiritual principle of mm -hmm. do not be unequally yoked. These are these are all yeah. very different, you know, three sets of verses, one after the other. They're talking about two different types of things, and they, they really shouldn't mix. And it really just brings a, a smile to my face, and I'm like, wow, you know, God's Word is just so beautiful, and there's so much in it. But to the same point, you know, with these types of things, you do need to be careful that you're not pulling things out of thin air. Right. Um, that you, should, you should always try, once you come to a conclusion of, I think this is what this is talking about, Ask yourself the question, is it a biblical thought? Is it yeah. a bi biblical principle? Because if it is, it sh you should find it elsewhere. <clears throat> yep. um, if, if, if you have an allegory allegory or an uh, illustration that you think you're getting a biblical teaching out of, the question is, is there a place where it's clear teaching? Mm -hmm. um, Jesus himself was uh, asked why he was teaching in parables, and he said, the reason why I teach in parables is because I'm trying to hide the truth from people. <laughs> and, and, they, and they say, well, speak plainly to us. And then every so often when he, they asked him to speak plainly, he would start teaching more like Paul, or, or uh, you know, he says, this, this symbolizes this, and this symbolizes that, and this is what this is about. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes he's just like flat out, this is what's going to happen, this is what I'm talking about. And he's not using any sim symbology he's not using any parables people often think that jesus is teaching in parables in order to illustrate the truth when in fact jesus clearly said he was hiding the truth <laughs> right because the the truth only comes by the father yeah and that's the thing like why would jesus hide the truth that sounds sort of contradictory <laughs> like isn't he supposed to like tell us the path of righteousness and tell us the truth so we can clearly follow but you know it comes by faith you know it's it's really you know yeah the the Father gives you the knowledge. Like if, if you have a humble heart and you're seeking diligently mm -hmm. after Christ, it's, it's He, the Holy Spirit is your teacher, right? right? The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And yeah. um, as long as our, our heart is in the right place, we have a repentant heart and we're seeking towards Christ, you know, He, yeah. he will teach us these things. And, and everyone who asked Him to explain something, He absolutely did. Mm -hmm. And so that's what He was looking for, is He was teaching the crowd and then the people that asked to understand um, they came and asked what was going on and what that meant. And uh, the people that just wanted to hear stories, they heard just stories or parables or principles or whatever. And they just went away thinking whatever they mm -hmm. wanted to think. But the people that were really seeking the truth would come and find out. Yeah. See, just before we started shooting, uh, you kind of pointed to that same, a similar thing with the Old Testament. That the Old Testament is the parable, is the, is the, Generally, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the hidden truth. And the New Testament is the clear speaking, is the explanation of the Old right. Testament. Yeah, there was a pastor, I don't know, I forget the name exactly, but uh, the phrase was, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, where this is this is mostly talking mm -hmm. about Christ, where yeah. you know, Christ really was concealed, in, in a sense, to the Jews, yeah. even to his closest disciples. They were, they were <laughs> thinking, he, they, they knew that he was the Messiah, but they... They thought he was going to be different 
and they thought he was going to serve a different purpose. And then when he died, they were all very much confused. Yeah. But then the Holy Spirit, you know, revealed to them. Mm-hmm. It, uh, I think uh, you know it says it revealed to them the scriptures, or or actually when Jesus came back, right? He concealed his his image to people on the pathway walking. The road you know. to Emmaus, yeah. Yeah, he said, um, you know, and then he opened their eyes to the scriptures. That's like, <laughs> that's one of the coolest things is, you know, yep. and a lot of us have those moments where, you know, we, we've been reading the Bible for so long and sometimes the Holy Spirit will just reveal something to you. And you're like, huh, yeah. I could, I've read that so many times and now it just yes. sticks out to me. And Down at the Ark Encounter, um, one of the most emotional, you, you've been to there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the most emotional place in the ark for me was, I don't know if it was for you too, was the door. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the door is, uh, I mean, because it is the symbol of entering in to be saved by Christ, right? Mm-hmm. But it also is just that the idea that once this door was closed, everyone outside yeah. perished. And just like, that, that's phew, heavy stuff, but um, just that, that symbol and when Noah was building the ark and built the door, he wasn't thinking, I'm building a, a, uh, a symbol of Christ, mm-hmm. uh, Jesus Christ to come. Um, but yet us looking back on it, that's exactly what that was all about, right? Mm-hmm. right? I mean, the, the whole, the, the reason why, and you see that little line in the uh, Old Testament story of um, God himself closed the door. Mm-hmm. Right. And just they like, that's kind of a weird thing to put in there, mm-hmm. you know? Like, what does that mean? Like, God, what, what does that even mean? But when you realize that God knew absolutely he was talking about Christ in that situation, that Christ was the ark to come, then suddenly it makes sense. Right. Um, that God it was is putting in a little exclamation point there, like, hopefully you, you get this. Yeah. And we see those kind of breadcrumbs all throughout the Old Testament where... Um, you know, you just had these weird encounters that just, at, at first you kind of realize what you're talking about here. And, you know, um, Abraham has the, uh, the, the three angels come to him, right? And you're like, okay, so it's angels coming down, right? Mm-hmm. And then, then he, he offers him bread or whatever, and, and he, they refuse, but then they put an offering, put it out as an offering, and then he touches it with his staff and it, it bursts into flames. And mm. you're like, wait a minute, why is there an offering taking place here? <laughs> and then you're like, I don't think that's just an angel. <laughs> like he's receiving worship. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah, okay. Is this, yeah. is this Jesus? Yeah. Like, is this Jesus before he was in the human flesh? Mm-hmm. And that's oh. what uh, I think I have this, let's see, oh no, I don't, but it's, it's in, uh, in Corinthians, right, where it talks about uh, Israel throughout the desert, and it says, you know, the rock that was with them, um, the rock was Christ. And it actually says, like, Christ was with them yeah. throughout their travels, uh, mm-hmm. throughout the wilderness. And you're like, wow, there, there's so many examples of Christ throughout the Old Testament. And it's, yeah, yeah if, you, if you don't already know that, and you start to look into the, these things, yeah. Be careful, like you said. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to go off the rails. Um, yeah. But you know, there's really good, solid biblical teaching on right. you know Christ in the Old Testament. There's actual Christ in the Old Testament. Yeah. Christoph, yeah. Um like w- when uh, in Genesis one, when it says that uh, the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep, mm-hmm. and God said, "Let there be light." Did God the Father say, "Let there be light"? Mm-hmm. He didn't. Right. That was Jesus. Yeah. We find in the New Testament that it was Jesus who created. Right. Yeah. So it was Jesus who spoke. Mm-hmm. But in the Old Testament, you don't you don't quite get that. A lot of we were talking Until earlier. In the yeah. New Testament, you, you you get told that this was actually Christ. Yeah. Like Christ wasn't like sitting back watching God the Father create. Mm-hmm. God the Father is like, hey. It was through him. And <laughs> Jesus is like, okay, let there be light. Yeah. And Jesus was doing the creating. Um, and. We just, we see that again and again. We see, um, uh, you know, these, these moments where, like Gideon, when he starts worshiping the angel, mm-hmm. you're like, that's not an angel because angels say, stop worshiping yeah. me. When Paul, was it Paul that dropped down? And, uh, says, like, no, yeah. we, we, you know, we worship the same God. Don't bow down to me. But then in that case, yeah, he, it wasn't He's just like, okay, go ahead and worship me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. oh. 
<laughs> or like Melchizedek. I think that's, you know, when you look at how Melchizedek, the, you know, the figure in the Old Testament is described, like, mm. as a prince of peace, like all, all the words that describe Melchizedek really describe Jesus. Yeah. And like, wow. Some people say that that is actual physical Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I lean a little against that into more of a naturalistic, that he was a type of Jesus. He was like a symbol of Jesus. But, mm -hmm. uh, but some people do say like, man, that's, that's kind of odd. Yeah. Like Melchizedek, there's something going on with him. Right. And uh, so he's either definitely a very strong symbol of Christ or mm -hmm. he was actually Jesus. Yeah. And uh, so. So yeah, it's, I just really wanted to bring this up to just encourage people. Because again, people, people either just don't like the Old Testament because it's, it's a lot. And I mean, it is a lot. Even there's things that I read and I'm just like, I have no idea what's going on here. But, you know, I just like, yeah. okay, I, I'm just going to keep on reading. Let, let yeah. the Spirit teach me, it, you know, uh, as He wills. But it's really just to spark that passion to say, you know what? There, there's a lot more in here than I think people yeah. realize. And, and particularly, we were talking about there's some pastors that just say, oh, you know, the Old Testament's only for the Jews. Yeah. The New Testament's for Christians. Or... I really loved all the things that you were bringing up about you know Christ in the Old Testament that the world was created through him that it was it was Christ yeah. as hovering over the waters of the deep you know a lot of people also come up with this confusion of oh there's so much bloodshed and you know God is really like slaying all these people but look at Jesus you know it, it's all you know grace and love and then you realize that you know God never changes, and it's it's the same. And we, then you... we go back and we visit Jesus like we are in our study in Revelation, and Jesus is not fluffy little right. lamb Jesus anymore. The Lion um, of Judah. He starts sounding a whole lot more like Old Testament Jesus once right. again. And I think that we do him a great disservice um, to to see him in his love, mercy, and compassion as if that's just who he is, rather than it's because of this patience, this... He is giving us this chance to turn from our rebellion, mm -hmm. but in the end, he will put down the rebellion. Yep. And uh, that's what the tribulation period is. That's what the, uh, um, the judgment is going to be. In the Old Testament, there was not a toleration of evil, and the Israelites were not supposed to tolerate evil. Um, but in this period, uh, God has very clearly separated the church from government. Mm -hmm. separate authority he's given the government uh the the sword right right the, the capital punishment he has not given that to the church right but in the old testament the church or or israel and the israel government was one and the same mm. and that's why we see some of the discrepancies in the old testament where the laws are like well to put this person to death and we're just like as christians we're like me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm right. supposed to put it down? Right. Like, no, no, you're not, because you're not a government. Right. Right? Uh, if you're in government, then then you ought to follow the, the edicts and laws of the land and uh, of God. Right. And that's, uh, that's absolutely true. But once again, when this age comes to an end, I, I don't know your future uh, uh, mm -hmm. theology, but uh, my future theology is that at the end of the tribulation, we have the 1,000-year literal reign of Christ on right earth. There with you. And so we, we have this, we're going back to uh, Jesus being literally the government. Right. And, mm -hmm. and people will be executed for committing crimes against Jesus again. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I may have just shocked a few of you out there, <laughs> but Jesus will execute yeah. people who rebel against his government. That's, uh, that's what we see. Yeah. And uh, that's, your local assembly at church should not be doing that. Yeah. Um, but when Jesus comes back and he is the government, that yeah. those type of things will be taking place. And that, you know, in this, in this whole, in the midst of me learning about the Old Testament, you know, one of the things that uh, is just, just amazing to read, you know, considering all the bloodshed and everything like that, is, you know, the wages of sin is death. And particularly when Israel committed certain sins, there was a certain sacrifice that had to be had to be made. And if you look at yeah. how the sacrifice was carried out, they're talking about sprinkling blood on the tent of meeting, there's sprinkling blood yeah. on the all I mean it's it's like oh, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's just like blood everywhere. And you know what I thought is, you know, in that in that day, which a lot of things were based mm -hmm. on sight, I mean, we we live by faith, not by sight, but right. can you imagine living back in that age and, and sort of living by sight and the wages of sin is death and you could literally see the death that was caused by the sins of Israel. Like, yeah. 
we don't say, I mean, there's sin rampant. I just think it's so incredible in the Old Testament, really, Israel could see <laughs> their sin, like the death right. that their sin has brought forth. I mean, even in the garden, right. um, and uh, you know, the God was, God clothed Adam and Eve with the hides of animals. And so right. it was almost like yeah. the first deaths that had to cover them um, because of the sin. So yeah, yeah, they weren't eating meat at that point until after the flood, uh, they, they did not eat meat. So mm -hmm. this was an animal that was killed and they don't kill animals until after the flood, except mm -hmm. for uh, sacrifices. Yep. And it ser served yeah. as like a, you know, they, they tried to cover them via their own means. Like they, they tried to cover themselves with something that yeah. didn't quite work. And you know, I, I also sort of see that as a type of representation, like yeah. God was foreshadowing, you know, what was uh, to come throughout the Old Testament and then ultimately through Christ and, and his covering. But yeah, that, that an animal had to die. And yeah, yeah that's, I'm covering you now. So yeah, yeah just, just so, lots of amazing stuff. So much in the Old Testament. And I look forward to uh, Bold Faith Bible. Uh, I was just realizing that we haven't actually delved into the Old Testament with any of the uh, Bible studies yet. And that is to come for sure. Um, I look forward to joining with you guys in that those studies. But uh, um, thank you so much yeah, for- uh, thanks. For joining and like i said if you want to check down in the description down below for uh, uh on point preparedness and michael over here he's got a lot of stuff uh particularly focusing in on uh, uh false teachings All in right. the churches so if you if you have a if you've been hearing stuff and you're kind of like i wonder what uh, the biblical take is on this movement or these kind of teachings um michael's actually uh the guy to, to listen to on a lot of stuff Particularly if you're, uh, I know a lot of you guys come from my preparedness channel and prepping channel. So he's actually very attuned to uh, a lot of the false teaching that's going on within the preparedness community. And he will walk you through uh, just the Bible verses and the, uh, the doctrinal points. And, and also kind of share with you kind of where a lot of these people are, are coming from with their doctrine on those things. Mm -hmm. So very interesting stuff. Um, if you're uh, listening to a bunch of channels out there and you want to kind of hear more about uh, like things like Hebrew roots um, and just things like moralism and just a lot of those other teachings, um, check out his channel for that. Thank you. All right. Otherwise, um, I will see you guys later. God bless you all.